having the most impact on me was conceptual art from the period before the 80s and the 70s. And I thought a lot about Duchamp, and I thought about Duchamp's um, found objects. And I thought the idea of creating a painting that was sort of a simulated old master painting, like a fake old master is why I was calling them that, and then present it as if I found it, like a kind of found object. And then bringing that to the context of the contemporary art scene, you might blow some fuses. By the time I did that portrait of Lady Crimp, I was in Lille, and there was a Goya of a woman sort of vanitas looking in a, in a mirror, and her nose is about that long. And, <laughs> and some of the sort of exaggeration of the features, but to maintain is still a kind of a, no exaggeration in the way they're painted, but just in the way that the people look. If it's an imaginary character, if it's not non-representational, if it's uh, it, 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 to the degree of anything in reality, then it becomes somewhat abstract. It becomes almost the same principles of an abstract painting. Through the sort of um, topography of the face, you can convey the inner emotions and the inner states of mind of the subject for what you're painting. So then it really is like, that's a, a good example, in my opinion, of say what a mental state painting is all about. That may not be the way somebody looks, but that's the way they think. That's the way they feel. If you went into the mind of that person, that's what it would look like. But over here with the red antipodular portrait, you've taken an image that most people will think of as relating to cartoons. Yeah. And given it the, the kind of gravitas of an old master portrait and a character who's looking at you like, how the hell did I get in this face? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the greatest thing that happened with this painting for me was I went to bed and when I woke up, he was there. I went up in the room and there he was just staring at me. And he started a whole, that configuration, that topography of again, the, <clears throat> the hill with the sort of stone on it and the sort of jowls and the sort of, you know, almost like sexual sort of uh, forms that, create the, uh, the visage. So there's always a tension between being repelled by them and also admiring them and yeah, being drawn think, to them, which feels set like you that's... Back, you know, like to say, like, why am I fascinated by this? You know, like, why am I looking at this? And what, what is it that's... I think that was probably one of the things that I liked about Goya as a, as a early uh, young artist, like, looking at that. And, and I liked about Bacon was that, and I liked about Picasso was the idea that the more sort of torn apart things were, the more um, almost horrifying they were, the more I wanted to look at it. In this painting though, you want to be able to hear. You know, you want to be able to hear her sort of shriek. And uh, I felt like the colors and the composition and everything about it, you really, I feel like, you know, it has an audio-like effect where there's something silent about that. Maybe you hear a little bit of the clanking of the, uh, of the tray as she brings in this sort of wine and bottle to the butler. Now this one's got a real shriek to it. These characters, they always keep a straight face when they're in their job, but in private, have expressed this kind of internal anger about this dehumanization that they seem to be living through. All the painters from the period of time that I liked had to put their signature crucifixion out. And so I had created this physiognomy of the figure and the face that could now sort of host, it could be hosted by the uh, series of the crucifixion. And I also thought if you're going to paint them, they might as well look like your paintings. These are pictures in which there are very, very small details that spread across every inch of the canvas for an overall composition. And from afar, they look abstract. You right. get up close and you realize it's something completely different. 
like to start in the middle and then everything just started to evolve all the way out to the corner so you've got almost this diagonal line that cuts that way and another one that cuts that way so it's almost like a big x in the middle and everything's sort of expanding out through the center and that's where i came up with the idea of this idea of the expanding canvas to just start at one point and just to have it run as a stream of conscious you'll have like crowns you'll see some jewels you'll see tablecloths a bird cage with a bird in it People like treasures. People like to get a prize in a cereal box. They like to have that feeling like they've found something, you know, that they found a treasure. And so I wanted to create sort of treasures of a sort of imaginary race of, of, of characters. If it really happened that the queen were to have commissioned me to do her portrait, it wouldn't be fair and it wouldn't be right and if I didn't do it in my own sort of style, in the way that I paint. And I thought, how can I make the queen look like one of my paintings? This one, strangely enough, almost looks like the portrait of the queen and the queen mother combined. It almost looks more sometimes to me like, you know, where that, she looks like a woman who looks like the queen, or sort of the gardening queen. This is an obscure abstraction, I call it the Mad Queen. And here, it was just a color composition between this kind of purple and green, and, um, and this is more like a chess, you know, I think of the queen on a chessboard, and it's almost like a chess piece in that sense, you know? To me, honestly, I think of them as playful variations on, a, on an image of the queen. I don't see them as being... Um, you weren't out to poke fun at the queen. I wasn't after, I was after poking a little fun at her. <clears throat> I thought, you know, if she's a real, you know, the queen, they have a good, probably has a good sense of humor. I've seen her in a lot of the photographs, she's smiling and, you know, your Queen Elizabeth is kind of like our Liz. <laughs> Liz Taylor. Yeah.